been going around the country talking about drones. She uh, is mostly known as the founder of Code Pink, uh, a very energetic national activist group. Many of you have seen her uh, in Washington, D.C., making a nuisance of herself in the halls of government. Uh, and be before that, Medea uh, actually started Global Exchange, which uh, some of you, Vic, has uh, gone with their program to the Middle East. So um, we all have contact with Medea's work. And uh, so it's really an honor to have her here to talk about her book, about the drones, and uh, maybe a little bit about all this wonderful organizing she's been doing around the country.
10 Americans said that it was just fine and dandy to kill these terror suspects with drone strikes. And that included a majority of Democrats and also a majority of people who identified themselves as liberal Democrats. So that just kind of hit me in the head with a ton of bricks, thinking that this industry has done a good PR job and has sold these drones as a way of waging war in a humane kind of way. And of course, it's not just the industry, it's the Pentagon, it's the military industrial congressional complex uh, understanding that Americans are sick and tired of seeing American soldiers being killed and tired of spending billions of dollars on war, including $2 billion a week that we continue to spend in Afghanistan. And so they've devised a way to keep waging war on the cheap without risking the lives of the American people. And that also means that it's outside of the purview of most American people. Uh, so I was at a State Department meeting, and uh, while they don't really talk about the drones because it's a secret program, uh, they'll say, oh, you can come and talk to us, but we can't really talk to you. And when you say the drone attacks, they'd say the alleged drone attacks. Um, but they did say at one point after the meeting was over and it was off the record, one of the State Department people from the democracy program of the State Department said the drones were really a miracle weapon. A miracle weapon. Uh, because they are so easy to use, precise, you know, all of that, uh, and, and cheap. So, um, that's, uh, that's the way that it's being portrayed. Now, in terms of the drones themselves, they date back, and I have a chapter in the book that looks at the history of the drones, and it goes back to uh, the Second World War. But it really was that after 9-11, the drones came into their own. Uh, the Pentagon only had maybe about 50 drones in its arsenal in the year 2000. Today, they have way over 7,000. Most of those are surveillance drones. They come in all shapes and sizes. In fact, anybody want to say your, uh, give some examples of, of drones? The hummingbird? Yeah, yeah. The hummingbird. Is that your favorite drone? <laughs> I don't like any of them, but <laughs> I love hummingbirds, like as nature. I always thought if I came back or was a uh, not a person, I would be a hummingbird. And um, just the fact that there is a hummingbird drone is so offensive uh, to me as a potential hummingbird. But um, anybody else here want to say your other ones? What what other drones have you heard about? Butterfly. <laughs> Butterfly, yeah. <laughs> that offends you. Yeah. That's my icon. Because you like the butterflies. Yeah. Anybody else have a drone they uh, are offended by? Or? So, we, we've been talking so far about the smaller drones. So there's drones the size of little insects, drones the size of hummingbirds and other kinds of birds. There's the dragonfly drones. Uh, and um, there are the drones that the soldiers put in their backpacks and then they can launch them individually and they go and survey the terrain and uh, the information is being revealed in real time to the soldiers. Uh, and then there are the killer drones, which are the predator and reaper drones. They are made by a company in Southern California called General Atomics. And they're the size of a small airplane. And then there's the big drones, like the Global Hawk, that are the size of a commercial airplane. Uh, and those are the, the uh, very large surveillance drones. So they come in all sizes, in all shapes. And yes, I would say it's pretty offensive that millions of our tax dollars are used to study the beauty and the miracle of nature, like a hummingbird or a butterfly and the biomimicry being used to develop a more and more sophisticated kind of spying and uh, lethal uh, technology. So these drones um, are being deployed in many places now around the world. Anybody want to say where, where drones are being used? In Pakistan? Arizona. Arizona, Yemen, Yemen. 
We're not. We're oh, not. So it's the first you. <laughs> so that's right. We don't know all the places they're being used. We know, and what we know hasn't come from our government. Although I must say that President Obama was very expansive when they did a uh, White House report to Congress that they're supposed to do every six months. And for the first time in this report, they said, we are doing military activity in Yemen and Somalia. Never use the word drones. Um, so yes, this has been secret program because it's in the hands of secret organizations like the CIA, or the Joint Special Operations Command, also known as JSOC, of the military. We know the drones were very important in uh, the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And in fact, my uh, first interest in the drones went back to the invasion of Afghanistan because I remember watching the TV screens and hearing the commentators say, rest assured, we now have these precision bombs, these very smart bombs, laser-guided missiles, and we will just target the evildoers and not no collateral damage in this kind of a war. And as a uh, organizer of a, a, and founder of a human rights organization called Global Exchange, I thought I'd better go there and see for myself and lo and behold, just three weeks after the invasion of Afghanistan, I found streams of people pouring over the border into Pakistan and heard their heart-wrenching stories about members of their family being killed by our precise weapons. And uh, so not only are we using the drones in the more declared wars in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, but the drones are used in, uh, were used in Libya. Now, I think it's very important to say something about drones being used in Libya. That is that there was a lot of debate in the media about the, uh, the good and bad points of going into Libya militarily. And even some of the people in the progressive movement had different opinions about it. But one thing we should be aware of is that the Obama administration said that it could go into Libya without any consultation at all with Congress because they were going to use drones. And when you use drones and American lives are not at risk, then there, the War Powers Act has nothing to do with that. Congress has no say in that. And so it hands over this incredible power to the executive branch of government to say we can engage in violence wherever we want without even going to Congress. Of course, with the Congress we have, had they gone to Congress, Congress would say go ahead and bomb them. But um, it's important to think for the future what kind of precedent this is setting. Uh, we have, um, in the case of Iraq, when the Obama administration removed most of the troops from Iraq, the Iraqi people and government thought the drones would be leaving as well. Little did they know that the drones would be transferred from the military into the hands of the State Department in Iraq, which is now operating its fleet of drones. And another set of drones was transferred over the border into Turkey. And those drones have been used for surveillance to give information to the Turkish government in their conflict with the Kurds putting the U.S. smack in the middle of another conflict it shouldn't be in. But the place where the drones have been used the most overseas has been in Pakistan. Uh, this was started under the Bush administration, but there was one drone strike every 40 days during the Bush administration. When Obama came in, it turned out to be one strike every four days. So the vast majority of the drone strikes have been under the Obama administration. In fact, you could say that while Bush was more into capturing people and throwing them into Guantanamo and indefinite detention, the Obama administration said that was actually quite messy because you had to deal with civilian trials, military courts, uh, what do you do with the people if you want to let them go, that it was easier and cleaner to just kill them, which is what this administration has been doing, without the hue and cry that many of us uh, shouted about the Bush administration. Uh, it has been, until very recently, very quiet, the reaction 
to the Obama administration's policy. In the case of, uh, of Pakistan, the first drone strike under the Obama administration was just three days after he came into power, and it was a mistake in the sense that it didn't hit its target. Instead, it hit the family of a man who was part of a peace committee and killed his family, as well as the local shopkeeper and several of the neighbors. Then there were a series of, of strikes after that. Uh, and how many people have been killed? Well, the, the group that I think does the best compilation of information, because journalists are not allowed into the area of northern Pakistan, is a group called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism that says there have been about 3,000 people killed in Pakistan alone by the drone strikes. Of those, 175 are children. Now, these pictures are never shown in the U.S. mainstream media. And that is quite remarkable, given that this program has been going on now since 2004. Uh, how, I, I, I go back to the, the uh, poll that says that 8 out of 10 Americans say it's okay to use drone strikes, and thinking that the American people, just like all people around the world, are basically good people, that if they had a chance to see these pictures, if they had a chance to understand who was being killed by these drone strikes, who was being orphaned, who was being wounded, that there would be a well of compassion, that there would be a different feeling towards these drone strikes. But we don't see these pictures, partly, of course, because we have a corporate media that isn't very interested in showing these pictures, and journalists who are not putting their lives at risk, as they have done in past conflicts, including in Vietnam, to get the photos, to get the information out to us. So, in the book, I have a whole chapter that's dedicated to uh, the victims of the drone strikes, and I tell a lot of stories that really humanize them. Because it's so hot in here, and I want to be uh, shorter tonight than, than I would normally be, and I'm not going to read from the book, but I know that you're all going to buy the book, so that you can read for yourselves. But I really do think it's important to get a sense of who are these victims. For example, I talk about uh, a drone strike that hit the family of a man called Karim Khan, and how it killed his son who had just graduated from high school and was starting to teach in the local village school, along with, his, uh, with Karim Khan's brother, who was not a militant, not a militant sympathizer, but a school teacher with a degree in English literature who would actually fight the Taliban to tell them the importance of education over the importance of, 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 of military might. And how he left behind a widow, a two-year-old child, and hundreds of school children who could not resume their education and were aching for revenge. And that's the one, an important part to understand, that every time there is a drone strike, people are left aching for revenge. I want to speak for a minute about, so who is killed? And the US constantly says they are militants. Well, until recently, the administration didn't admit how it defined militants. But an article that came out in the New York Times on May 29th of this year, was an amazing revelation of the intimate role that President Obama plays in this drone program. And I was trying to find that out as I wrote the book, and it was hard to get an understanding. But when this piece came out, it was people from within the administration who leaked this to the press. And they did it as part of their election strategy to try to win over independence in case there were still people who thought that maybe President Obama was soft on terrorism. They wanted to show that he can kill just like the best of them, just like any Republican could kill. And talked about how easy it was for him to come up with a kill list. How they would meet every week on Terror Tuesdays and come look at a list that had people's profiles and pictures that resembled baseball cards and really play prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner, and, and even God, 
decide who is to live and who is to die, and that this was an easy thing for the president to do. Well, every time you hear about a drone strike, you hear that militants were killed. And this article admitted that the, the administration defines any male of military age in the areas where we are using the drones is a militant. Point blank. It's really absolutely remarkable, one, that they would admit that, and two, that they would do that. I mean, talk about racial profiling. Anybody that lives in the area that is old enough to have some facial hair on them is considered a militant. So think about when they say 10 militants killed, 8 militants killed, who are these people? Many of them absolutely not involved in any kind of military activity. And some of them, yes, involved in military activity, but perhaps because they were trying to get the occupiers U.S. occupiers out of their territory. And so we have to really think when they use this term militant what it is that they are referring to. There's also two ways that the CIA and JSOC are able to press the kill button. And one is if they know an individual who the president has put on the kill list and say, go after this person. And sorry to point to the Everbeard, so I would say, you know, you're on the kill list and then um, the pilots remotely from a place like uh, Creech Air Force Base could target you. But there's also the authority to do something called uh, signature strikes, and that's just on the basis of suspicious behavior. So if there is a meeting of, with a bunch of guys with beards and turbans carrying guns, which characterizes just about everybody in the area where we are doing these drone strikes, they are considered suspicious, engaging in suspicious activities if they are having a meeting, for example. So, um, what are the Pakistani people doing about this? Well, we found out from WikiLeaks that the government initially made a deal with the United States and said, uh, actually said to the U.S. Ambassador, Ann Patterson at the time, that you can do these drone strikes and we will yell and scream about it, we will denounce you, we will go to the National Assembly and denounce you, but then we'll ignore it. And that worked for the government for a while until they realized that these drone strikes were killing a lot of innocent people. And in fact, there was a drone strike that happened in um, Pakistan on October 30th, 2006, that hit a school, a madrasa, killed 81 civilians, 69 of them children. And it was at that point that the military said, we will not cover for the Americans anymore. Now we really are serious in denouncing these drone strikes and asked the government to stop them. And the US government said no. So it went to the parliament, the National Assembly voted three times unanimously, which is almost unheard of in Pakistan, to say, we demand now that the U.S. government stop these drone strikes. And the U.S. government, despite saying that it supports democratically elected governments, um, refused to listen to the Pakistani government. And that continues to this day. The Pakistani people have also come out by the hundreds of thousands they blocked U.S. bases in Pakistan. They burned American flags. They protested every way that they know how uh, against the drone strikes. And um, we, uh, the, the general feeling in Pakistan can be summed up in a, uh, a, a poll that was taken just last week that said that of the people in Pakistan who know about the drone strikes, because there are many people who don't get information from their local press about this, of those who know, 97% were against the drone strikes. 97% of the people. And that the drone strikes are counterproductive, that they are radicalizing the local population, they are the best recruiting tool for the Taliban, they are turning local people against the government, and they are increasing the anti-American sentiment. 
you would think that someone in the U.S. government would say, maybe we ought to stop these drone strikes. Instead, what they have done is given the same authority to both the CIA and the Joint Special Operations Commander, JSOC, to do the same thing in Yemen. And the Yemen drone strikes began later under the Obama administration. They began in 2009. The first drone strike in 2009 was also, quote, a mistake in that it killed a lot of civilians. And there have been many drone strikes now in the last six months uh, that have killed civilians, that have killed uh, the deputy government. In fact, the, when the dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was in power uh, during the Arab Spring when people were rising up and his own people started rising up, Ali Abdullah Saleh would say to the U.S., you know, that person is Al-Qaeda, that person is Al-Qaeda. And these were, of course, the opposition people who were rising up against him. So the U.S. was taking the word of a dictator to go around and, and be offing people. So uh, in the case of Yemen, you can just look at the statistics that show that the group called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula had 200 uh, members at the time of the beginning of the drone strikes and controlled no territory. Today, they're said to have over a 1,000 members and they control significant territory, which is why a young 23-year-old 20, Yemeni uh, human rights activist wrote a piece in the New York Times on June 13th entitled, How Drones Help Al-Qaeda. And he said that the drone strikes are causing more people to join the radical militants, not driven by ideology, but by revenge and despair. He says, the short-term gains from killing military leaders is minuscule compared to the long-term damage the drone program is causing. Another thing in, in Yemen is that the U.S. is not only killing people from Yemen, it is killing Americans in Yemen as well. So I wonder, raise your hand if you've heard of the case of Anwar al-Awlaki. So you are a very sophisticated audience here because I think most of the people in this country have never heard of him. He was an American citizen, a cleric born in the United States, moved to Yemen, known for his fiery sermons. Uh, the Obama administration put him on a kill list and killed him with the drone strike along with another American, Samir Khan. The administration says it has proof that he was not only preaching anti-U.S. Uh, sermons, but that he was also engaged in activities to kill Americans. But when the Center for Constitutional Rights and the ACLU took the government to court to get that information, uh, the government said, no, we cannot reveal that on the grounds of national security. Uh, even worse is that two weeks after killing Anwar al-Awlaki and Samir Khan, a drone strike killed the son of Anwar al-Awlaki, Abdul Rahman al-Awlaki. And here he is, pictures of him. Uh, these pictures are from his Facebook, is that right? Yeah, from, uh, from the Facebook page that his family maintained in according to the So according to his Facebook page beforehand, which he had, uh, he said he liked uh, rap and hip hop and swimming. His friends in Denver said he was just an ordinary American boy, had no interest in any activities that his father might have been engaged with in, uh, and he was killed basically because of who his father was. Um, when, uh, excuse me, I have yeah, please. There were six or Maybe you could stand up and hit. There were six or seven other teenagers with Abu uh, Rahman when he was killed, and they died with him. It was a, a teenage birthday party. So I said uh, in the beginning that for most of these years, the Obama administration has kept silent about the drone strikes. It has only been since March that there has been information coming out about that. In fact, it was in March that Attorney General Eric Holder was speaking to a group of law students at Northwestern University and for the first time tried to justify this, this drone program on legal grounds. Uh, the 
the government's justification, according to international law, is that the U.S. government, like all governments, have the right to self-defense. Now, they have stretched the meaning of self-defense to make it unrecognizable according to international law. Because that's supposed to be if there is imminent danger, a bomb is ready to drop on you, an army is amassed at your border, and you have given your enemy a chance to surrender, which of course the drone strikes don't give anybody a chance to surrender. The U.S. government also says they're authorized according to the law that was passed right after September 11th, that gave the Bush administration the green light to use force against anyone associated with the 9-11 attack. The problem with that is that many of the people we're killing now were 10 or 11 years old at the time of 9-11. And also, many of the organizations we're now attacking, like the one in Yemen, didn't even exist at the time of 9-11. And then, perhaps worst of all, is the justification for the killing of Americans. And Eric Holder said, that Americans seem to be have a misunderstanding of their rights. Um, how many of you thought you had the right to a trial by jury? Well, you are wrong. And we are just learning this, that even though these rights were established 800 years ago now under the Magna Carta, it turns out that American citizens really don't have the right to a judicial process. We only have the right to something vaguely called due process. And the best response to Holder, I found, was not from the constitutional lawyers, but was from a late night comedian, Stephen Colbert. So Stephen Colbert said, yes, the founders weren't picky. Trial by jury, trial by fire, rock, paper, scissors, who cares? Due process just means there's a process that you do. <laughs> just happens to be the U.S. Constitution. How about a hand for Stephen Colbert, <laughs> one of the truth tellers of our times. Um, so, where does this leave us? Well, I think many people in the U.S. government think they can get away with this uh, because the U.S. reigns supreme when it comes to drones. Uh, but that's not the case for long because drones are not like nuclear weapons. They are technologies that are now being sold in the uh, global marketplace, and uh, it's quite easy to get your hands on drones. So U.S. is number one producer and user of drones. Who is number two? Israel. Israel, that's right. You read the book already, okay. number two user having used them extensively and continuing to use them extensively in the Gaza Strip, and number one exporter having exported to now 50 different countries. And then, what is the, who is the number three? Huh? No, number three producer. China. China is the number three. Uh, China sees a growth market and just steps in there and is producing all kinds of drones, like several dozen different types of drones. So we now know that there's at least 60 countries that have drones. There's non-state entities that have drones. And uh, raise your hand if you remember seeing the Iranian government show this beautiful drone that they downed that was a U.S. drone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of you re remember that. They uh, said that they hacked into the system, they brought the drone down without a scratch, uh, to really tweak uh, Obama, they not only held a press conference with all the, the media and said thank you for the sophisticated gift you gave us, but they also start producing little toy drones uh, out of the same model and sent one to Obama as a present. <laughs> a pink one, by the way. Um, but then a couple of months later they said we've now reversed engineered this drone and we are selling them. And we are working with the Venezuelans now to build a market, to, a, a factory in Venezuela to produce our own drones. So these things are now proliferating. There is an arms race in drones. And you've got to wonder what other countries are thinking, right? 
I mean, why shouldn't the Chinese go drop a Hellfire missile on the Uyghurs or the, uh, uh, the, the, the Tibetans that they say are terrorists? Or why shouldn't, the, uh, why shouldn't the Russians do that in the case of the Chechens, some of who are living here? Or why shouldn't the Cubans, who know there are known terrorists living in Miami, uh, send a drone over and drop it on their condominium in Miami? And if a couple of neighbors are killed in the process, well, you know, oops, as the U.S. would say. They're terrorists, too. Yeah. Hanging out with terrorists. Right. They're, they're, they're in the wrong place. They're obviously terrorists. Well, they so what we have to understand is that um, we are setting an example that says we can go anywhere we want, kill anyone we want, on the basis of secretive information, and why shouldn't other countries do that? Well, what goes around comes around, and we should be very concerned about the blowback. But we don't have to just worry about drones coming from uh, uh, people who might consider us the enemy, but drones from our own government. So let me see again. Raise your hand if you think there's a lot of drones already in use in the United States. Raise your hand if you think there aren't. You read the book, you're supposed to raise your hand. I think there are. I guess it's a definition of... Uh, I stated that. So it's a definition of how, how many is many, I think. Because I say that thousands are many. And right now it seems that um, we are in the hundreds. And that is because the uh, permitting process has been very restrictive so far. And it's the Federal Aviation Administration that controls the airspace and that is very worried about our safety and knows what most Americans don't know, which is these drones crash all the time. So they have been reluctant to give out permits. They've only given out, they only have about 300 permits that are current that have been given out to uh, Homeland Security, to the Border Patrol, uh, given out to the FBI. They have been given to u universities, state universities that are working on drone programs, companies that are making drones, and about 30 police departments. Those are the only ones now that have permits for the use of drones. But the drone manufacturers are very upset they push through legislation thanks to their Congressional Drone Caucus that says the FAA must open up the airspace to drones by September 2015 at the latest and to law enforcement agencies before that. The drone, that's in the book, yeah. And the drone manufacturers are drooling just thinking of the 18,000 police stations in this country and want every police station to have its own fleet of drones. Well, there's a problem, and that's most uh, police stations don't have much money anymore and are cutting back on their budgets. Well, in comes Homeland Security. See how smart this woman is after reading the book. Homeland Security steps in and is giving out grants to the police departments to buy drones. It's really grotesque. And we're paying for them, our tax dollars, of course, and they want to get them hooked on these drones. Well, just to give you a sampling of what they might be used for, there was a, uh, a, a sheriff's department outside of Houston that got a $300,000 grant to buy a drone. The CEO said the drone was supposed to be for surveillance, search and rescue missions, but it really was designed to be weaponized. It could have what we call less lethal systems. These include tasers that can electrocute suspects on the ground, beanbag firing guns, stun batons, grenade launchers, tear gas, rubber bullets, or even a 12-gauge shotgun. And of course, they can be equipped with all kinds of uh, all kinds of equipment for spying, surveillance. They can be equipped with thermal imaging, facial recognition techniques, Wi-Fi network tracking capabilities, and systems to intercept text messages and phone calls. But don't worry. The sheriff said, no matter what we do in law enforcement, somebody's going to question it, but we're going to do the right thing, and I can assure you of that. <laughs> Are you feeling reassured? No. So. 
drones, unfortunately, are coming home in a big way. But fortunately, there's a lot we can do to stop them before we see what is predicted to be 20 or 30,000 drones in U.S. airspace in the coming years. So some of the things that um, a group of people who got together in the drone summit decided to do. One is to preemptively contact our police departments. Uh, this is a campaign that the Electronic Frontier Foundation is doing. And I'm just going to pass around some simple questions. If you can make one phone call to your police department and ask them these questions, that would be wonderful. Another thing is to tell our congressional representatives who are supposed to be uh, uh, overseeing the CIA that they are doing a really lousy job, that the CIA is out of control, it's now a, a death squad, and that we have to get drones out of the hands of the CIA. We have a meeting next, uh, actually July 10th, with Senator Dianne Feinstein, the head of the Intelligence Committee, and we want to give her a lot of signatures of people who are disgusted and want drones out of the hands of the CIA. So I'm going to pass this around. I also have some uh, checks that you can do here. One uh, says, uh, is another campaign we're doing, which is to try to get your city to pass a resolution that says this will be a drone-free zone. So wouldn't that be good for your city to be a drone-free zone? Yes. Anybody interested in working on making this lovely city a drone-free zone? Raise your hand. So some of you are raising your hand. I think you're melting from the heat. So I'll pass this around. You can check here. And I'll, I, I have sample copies of the resolution. It's also on a website called droneswatch.org. And the uh, final thing that I wanted to mention to you, and you know what, I'll, I'll pull out some of these. And if somebody would mind passing some of these around, excuse me, down there, and, and if we could borrow a, a pen. Uh, that would be great. And uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is that we have been invited by a group of people in Pakistan to come and do a peace march precisely in the area where the drones are being launched. And uh, we think it is so important to show people around the world that we care about their lives. In fact, uh, a, a lawyer who is now working for the drone victims was for the first time on national U.S. television. That was on Rachel Maddow's show. Finally, we've been working very hard to get them on. And he said that the people of Pakistan think that the American people want to kill women and children with these drones. And that the American people think that the Pakistanis' lives are not worth anything. That they are non-people, that they are disposable people. And so it's so important for us to show that we do care about their lives. And we're taking a delegation to Pakistan October 3rd through 10th. If anybody is interested in finding out more about this, you can check the box there or come talk to me about it afterwards. So let me just end on the note that, um, that I think since this is such a sophisticated audience, you understand that the drones are simply a piece of technology and a reflection of a much larger problem that includes a more a militarized economy. And many people here have been, uh, in fact, raise your hand if you've been part of the Occupy movement. Well, it's just fantastic that there is a new Occupy movement and it's focused on corporate rule and corporate domination of our entire way of life. But you see this when, it, when you look at the drone program what Leon Panetta calls the only game in town, and how this is driven by corporations searching for new profits. And that uh, opposition to the drones is just part of a larger opposition to a militarized economy. I was just speaking in Oregon last week, and I was in a city where there, were there was a drone manufacturer. And afterwards, one of the engineers asked if he could talk to me afterwards, because he makes drones. And he said, I hate making drones. I feel immoral. My colleagues in the factory hate making drones. But we have not been able to find any viable, 
commercial uses for the drones uh, because the only reason uh, it is viable is because of the hundreds of millions of dollars that we get from the Pentagon for this program. And so we have allies within uh, the factories, we have allies in the, in the military, uh, we have allies in conservative folks like the libertarians, like the Ron Paul supporters that hate these drones. I think it's a terrible violation of basic uh, privacy rights and that actually want to work with us, uh, maybe in different ways than we're used to working, like Charles Krauthammer who said, uh, guns in the air, America, and the first person to shoot down a drone will be a folk hero in the United States. Um, not exactly the peace message we want to give out, but there are uh, people in the, not the hacker community, but the cracker community, right? Those who can uh, hack into or crack into drones uh, that say they are ready um, for the, the challenge. Um, there's all kinds of people who want to stop drones from invading our privacy here at home, creating a 24-7 surveillance society. But let's remember in the process of trying to stop the drones here at home, the people who are living under the terror of the drones around the world, that uh, go to sleep with the buzzing of the drones, that even have a word for the, that buzzing in their local language that says it's the sound of death. The children who go to sleep terrified, not knowing who will be killed during the night. And as people here who are part of a peace and justice community, it's important for us to be spreading the message to not only stop the drones here at home, but stop the drones around the world, ground the killer drones, take this war economy and turn it into a peaceful, sustainable economy that we need so much for our own benefit here at home, for the survival of this very, very overheated planet at home, and for the, um, the kind of relationship we need to have with the rest of the world. Um, it's about time, after 10 years of trying to fight, quote, fight terrorism uh, through all kinds of military, militarized ways, um, that we join with the rest of the world who says that the drone program is barbaric, that Americans have to relate to the rest of the world uh, in a way that shows that we care about their lives as much as we care about our own lives. So thank you for being such a great audience. And